Hi everybody and welcome back to Teachers Talk Money where I help teachers master their money in order to give back to themselves. As I announced last week, but in case you missed it, I did some audio interviews with teacher friends of mine back in the day when I thought I was going to make Teachers Talk Money a podcast before I had decided to make it a YouTube channel. And I wanted to share some audio of the interviews with you today, even though I decided not to do a podcast with my channel, because I got so much value out of having these conversations with my teacher friends, and because I think you guys will get a lot of value out of it as well. So last week we heard from Sarah, who is a public school teacher in Virginia, and she shared so many awesome things about how she was paying off her debt. She shared her salary. She talked about coaching a sport as a side hustle. And that was super awesome. And this week we're gonna hear from my friend Sam, who is a very different situation, but equally as I think fascinating and insightful because she works in a different field, sort of. So Sam is also a teacher, but she is an adjunct faculty professor at a local community college. So I loved getting insight into the ins and outs of what her profession looked like day to day, as well as the finances of being an adjunct professor. I think this will be really helpful since going into professorship is something a lot of secondary teachers go into after their years teaching in public schools. But also, Sam talks about buying her first real estate property, um, which is the condo that is her first home she's living in now. And I have no insight into investing on real estate because that is something that I've never done. So I got so much out of this interview. She also talks about house hacking, which is when you pay for the cost of your mortgage by renting out rooms to other tenants. Something she kind of fell into accidentally, but it has made a huge mark on her finances. Sam was super awesome into sharing the numbers of her mortgage, what she pays month to month, and what she makes in her salary as an adjunct professor. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy the second podcast interview. Please let me know if you are interested in me doing more of these interviews using video for the channel. Please enjoy the interview and I will see you guys on Thursday with another video. Welcome to the podcast, Sam. So I want to focus our conversation today around um, firstly your career as an adjunct professor and your decision to invest in real estate by buying your own condo. So let's start by talking about your career. You are an adjunct professor, correct? Or part-time? Correct, yes. Right. Adjunct faculty. Adjunct faculty, got yes. it. So what does a typical day in your profession look like? Well, um, it varies a lot by semester because mm -hmm. of the contractual nature of my employment. So basically at the beginning of the semester or usually at the end of the previous semester, they ask you, you know, what classes would you like to teach? Mm -hmm. And then they take that into consideration with all the other people who are there. And it's basically based on seniority. So the mm -hmm. I've been there a very long time. <laughs> uh, so I usually get the classes that I ask for. Great. Um, but that was not always the case. Um, so I would say this semester, for example... Um, I taught um, Monday through Friday, but I had Wednesday off. So I got an entire day off, mm -hmm. which is not very typical, I would say. But it's great to have a weekday off. You know, you can kind of run errands without everybody being there. That's awesome. Yes, it was good. Um, and then it was also great because Tuesday was my long day. So on, for example, on Monday, I only taught 2 to 5 and then 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. Mm. So I had a day class and a night class. And then on Tuesday, that was my long day. So I taught from 11 to 5 mm. and then 6.30 to 9.30. Oh, wow. So yeah. that was a long one, which having the Wednesday off really made a big deal. Yeah. So on Thursday and Friday, my ideal schedule, of course, would be <laughs> just to do 11 to 5 Monday through Friday. That would be yeah. good. Who doesn't love working six hours a week or six hours a day every five days a week? That's awesome. So what was like a bad week that you like a bad week schedule uh, okay. that you had yeah. early on so <laughs> early on <laughs> um i used to just take whatever they would give me because i just wanted to teach as many classes as possible because obviously you make more money the more money the more classes you teach mm. so um one of my first or s no i would say the first year i had <laughs> only three days a week i had classes right which sounds amazing but i was so exhausted from those three days it took mm. like two days to recover so my schedule was 8 a.m to 5 p.m and then 7.30 to 
on two days. So literally like 12 hours of teaching, which is just oh wild. Oh my god, 10.30 p.m. P.m. Oh, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was. I just wouldn't leave the college. So I would just stay mm. there. But literally the first class starts at 8. You got 8 to 11, 11 to 2, 2 to 5. Mm. And then at that time, the classes for the night classes were 7.30 to 10.30, which was rough. Coming home at a 10.30 class and then going back into an 8 a.m. the next morning, that was really hard for me. Um, but I was 22, 23 at the you time. So back. I was literally youth. like... I, <laughs> but, but, youth. <laughs> the power of youth. Um, I was like, I can do this all the time. I could even teach more classes. And now I'm like, <laughs> when I had that nine-hour day, I was like, oh my god. I'm I so would be tired. crying. Yeah, and I also refused to teach morning classes. <laughs> So I haven't taught an 8 a.m. in probably like two or three years because I'm not a morning person and I know that about myself. That's a good, yeah. That's a good thing. Night classes, I'm totally fine. It blows, Mm. my roommates do not work nights. And so my roommates are Mm. mind blown that I'll come home, you know, I'll get in my comfy clothes, change, hang out, and then I will just get back up and I'll go to work. You're just energized. (laughs) I just need that break and then I'm fine. So. Jeez, cool. So just let's just clarify for the audience, what do you teach as a professor and what... I'm interested to know, because I've heard you talk about this a little bit, but what is your um, work outside of class look like in terms of like grading, sure. lesson planning, and all that stuff? Yeah. So um, I mostly teach microbiology, laboratory mm-hmm. science. Um, so I do not teach lecture, which I think is a big help for me, because mm-hmm. um, if I taught lecture, I'd be the main person that they're coming to with their questions, which takes up a huge amount of my time anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also teach chemistry. I've taught um, general biology. Um, introduction to biology, which is called biology life sciences. Um, and I've taught a higher level of microbiology at 200 level, which um, was definitely a very interesting experience. But <laughs> um, my bread and butter, I would say, is uh, microbiology fundamentals. Awesome. Yeah. So I really enjoy mostly bacteria, you know, single cell <laughs> organisms. I really enjoy No, but bacteria. I really do, though. Like, it's, you have to understand, a lot of these people, like, never were interested in school. So that's a different thing right. I think about being at a community college versus mm-hmm. a four-year university. You have people who are genuinely trying to change their lives, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And they just, they care more. Like, and they're more interested in the subject, I find. You know, that could be wrong, but... Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, in the first week of classes, we do this experiment. It's called the ubiquity of bacteria. Is bacteria everywhere? Mm. Shocking answer, yes. Yes. <laughs> And people really think that they're like, oh, I'm, I'm very clean. You know, I clean my stuff. Like, you know, they just really don't expect right. to take samples from their personal items and get them mm. back next week. And there's bacterial growth, there's mold growth, and they're just like, what? Oh my God. But right. then at the end, they get to learn, you know, that that's actually a good thing. That it's good Off to have topic. your own microbiome. Yeah. yeah, but... Is bacteria even bad? <laughs> so yes and no. As everybody knows, this is a science podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the nitty gritty here, okay? Right, TBD on whether or not we'll edit yeah, out yeah, this exactly. bacteria stuff. <laughs> but maybe I'll keep it kind of spicy. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I love it. So, oh yeah. Oh, yeah and I did not finish the end of your that question. That is totally fine. So oh. grading and okay, yeah. lesson planning. How much time do you would you estimate you kind of put in outside of... Well, thankfully, with class. lesson planning, mm-hmm. I don't really need to do too much anymore. I've been teaching these classes for so long at this mm-hmm. point. Um, this is my seventh year. So mm-hmm. in the when we start the next semester, that'll start my eighth year teaching. So I d- generally don't have to do too much. Although, yeah. for example, when I got my friend a job, we can edit out Monica if she doesn't want her name in there, but Monica, <laughs> she... Um, she pointed out some errors in my PowerPoints and just stuff that I hadn't realized that I just hadn't been fixing. So I did do quite a few hours, like just, you know, perfecting the things. But I would say grading wise, I probably spend at least one hour per class Mm -hmm. every week because they have quizzes every week. They've got pre-labs, my chemistry reports. Oh my God, those things take me I mean, there's some of them are like 20 pages mm. and there's 24 students in a class. So the chemistry reports can take me easily three hours when we start to get into the harder subjects. You know, when it mm-hmm. starts out, subjects are a little bit easier and there's not too much to write on. Um, but as the subjects get harder, then they have to get into more detail and they mm-hmm. need to be more specific. And I have to actually not only read everything they wrote, but also check their math. So if they're, you know, are they using the calculations correct? Are they using significant figures the way they're supposed to be? And that takes a very long time. Would you say you kind of chunk out the grading and lesson planning stuff throughout the week, or do you do it all in one batch on one day? How do you kind of manage your work? So, interesting question. Uh, I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> yeah. Just, I always have been. 
And so I generally spend one day just dedicated to sitting at my table or sometimes I even go into work just to help me focus. But yeah. And I'll just grade like six to eight hours, you know, just know. in one swath. Because I find that when I try to split it up, I just don't really do it as well. So it takes yeah. me a lot longer to do something. Like if I'm trying to do something in between another activity, like if I do have some time to my classes, which is pretty rare, um, you know, maybe I'll try to grade, but then also you don't want to burn yourself out. So then I'll just be like, you know mm-hmm. what? Let me just hang out with my coworkers or I'll go bother somebody who works here full time. <laughs> and then I'll go back and I'll do my grading on Sunday. Yeah. So generally, yeah. Sunday is for grading for me. Very cool. Very cool. So as adjunct faculty, do you have any retirement accounts as part of your employment? No, I do not. So mm-hmm. I don't have actually any retirement um, plans, 401k, nothing like that mm-hmm. yet. It is in my plan. Mm-hmm. Um, but I put so much cash in my down payment for my condo mm-hmm. that I just didn't really feel like I was ready. And up to that point, I was still living with my parents. I still had no mm-hmm. idea what I was going to be doing, you know, for my life, basically. Yeah. Um, still don't, but, you know, <laughs> working on it. Um, but I do now have the cash on hand to actually set up a retirement fund. Awesome. Although I kind of consider my condo to be my retirement fund. Because it's certainly an investment. When I right. sell it, the the hope, the goal is that it, the property will have improved enough in value that I will actually make money on it instead of just breaking even. Yeah, so let's talk about your condo then. Yeah, so absolutely. Firstly, so how long did you live with your parents before you decided Oof, to... Way too long. Um, <laughs> no, I'm in all seriousness, it's it can be really difficult to stay with your parents, and I totally yeah. understand that because oh, I did it. But yeah. um, it was worth it. So I think I moved out when I was 25. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be 2004. 15 Mm -hmm. and I uh had moved with them many many times because my dad is in the well sort of in the construction industry like Mm -hmm. construction adjacent um (laughs) but uh, he built a lot of the houses we lived in and so I had a lot of experience from that but it just came to a point where I could not live with them anymore it wasn't from a financial you know aspect if I was smart I would have stayed two more years Mm. and I would have had enough money to get the single family on a little bit of property that I really wanted. Mm. But at that time, just mental health wise and like emotional health, I just had to get out. It just was not even an option. Totally. I can't even imagine living with my parents for a single year after college. (laughs) (laughs) No offense, mom and dad. I know really like we appreciate you so (laughs) much. You know what I mean? (laughs) But, (laughs) um, so what, why did you decide to invest in your condo? What factors, including money, location, and everything else, led to your decision to buy a condo in general, but specifically this one in this location <clears throat> and those things? Okay. So when I first moved out, I moved to, um, well, it's not called this anymore, but it's a it was like a lower income community in Columbia, mm-hmm. Maryland, obviously. Um, it's called the Berkshires. And it, <laughs> It was really fun. I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. It was it was exactly what you kind of need in your first one. It was a kind of crappy apartment. you know. I remember that apartment. Yes. Rachel, <laughs> Rachel's been there. Um, I don't think I'm talking it up or down too much. I think I'm right on level. It's a solid apartment. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it was a two bedroom, two bath, um, which in Columbia, getting that at 1300 a month was, mm-hmm. I mean, that was excellent. We That's were awesome. very surprised that we were able to find that for, for a two bedroom, two bath. Because mm-hmm. maybe and you could find And this was in, a, what, 2016? This was in technically still 2015 when we moved okay. in. It was uh, November of 2015. Okay. So um, I moved in and I moved in with somebody that I vaguely knew through my brother, but then I also knew through... Um, a job that we both had together. Um, so we're both managers at a aquatic facility. Mm. And um, <laughs> that's such spicy. a Columbia job. I know. Oh my God. Literally though, who hasn't worked at this location? <laughs> um, but so she was having likewise the, you know, just issues with being like, I need to be on my own. I need yes. to be away from my parent. You know, she was a little bit younger than me. Um, and she had a longtime boyfriend. And so she was like, all right, the plan is it'll be just me and her. We'll move out together. We'll split the cost of everything, you know, based on me having the master bedroom in that apartment mm-hmm. and paying a little bit more because of that. Um, and, you know, we'll we'll do it. We'll scrape by. We'll do it. We're, you know, it's not going to be easy, but it will definitely be worth it. And so, I mean, I can remember the first night we moved in, we were so excited. Like, so <laughs> we had nothing, nothing in there, really. Um, and we were just, we were so happy. But... Um, we stayed there for a year and 
per always when you're renting, they try to increase the rent every single year. So they wanted to increase it to, I think, 1500 a month, which we were both like, that is not going to happen. Yeah. Um, we just, first of all, couldn't afford it. And for what it was, definitely not worth 1500 <laughs> uh, a month. So um, that's when I kind of started looking for my condo and I knew it was going to be in Columbia. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I still had a dream of having a single family. So I looked mm-hmm. in the outer counties kind of surrounding Howard County um, to see if I could find something that still kind of fit the bill. But honestly, if you don't have 250000 or you can't get a loan for three hundred, at least, mm-hmm. you're not getting a single family with any no. kind of property. No. Even in, I mean, I went to see some dilapidated, like in very bad, basically knockdowns um, that were on very small properties that I was like, wished, you know, that I could afford, but I just couldn't afford it. Because you can't just think about the cost of the renovations, but mm-hmm. also just like, getting a roof done every 10 years and you got to do, you know, there's just so many added costs to an actual single family that I think a lot of people have that dream of, but mm-hmm. really don't understand the truth behind it. Well, I think that's su- such an interesting point of discussion and sometimes contention in the personal finance world mm-hmm. too, because there's this like long standing idea that, Oh, if you're renting, you're throwing your money away every month instead mm-hmm. of, putting that money back into an investment that right. is your own property. And there's some truth to that, that right? That is true. Because it's like, yeah. yeah, you get equity in your home, but how much cheaper is it really when, if you're renting, you don't have to deal with those renovation costs. costs. Nothing. You don't have to deal with the repairs right. that are completely unexpected. Exactly. Um, hopefully you have renter's insurance, so you yes. don't have to deal with we things did. like we flooding. Did. and th- Right? So yes. it's just kind of, it's a totally different um game so it's kind of hard to say oh you're throwing away versus you're putting into investment when there are these hidden costs too so i'm glad that you bring that up and i'm not gonna lie that was one of the breaking points for me when i decided to buy was just realizing the rent that i'm paying every month if i do a mortgage for 30 years i would be paying less and i'm like how Mm -hmm. am i just spending you know thirteen hundred dollars a month or well when you split the cost of the rent but then also add in utilities and you've got to feed yourself now because i'm not eating on my parents fridge anymore sadly buying my own food like you know buy my own paper towels you know Mm -hmm. like literally all those little costs and I just was like all right we need to actually buy something and Mm -hmm. again I was only able to do that really because of the amount of time I spent with my parents house at my parents Mm -hmm. house because I um saved the whole time I was there with my adjunct faculty work and Mm -hmm. I had multiple other jobs when I was you know in my 20s early 20s I'm still that's the way to do it when you've got the energy I'm talking like I'm old. No, but I'm we 23, are. but <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> but I've been teaching for two years, so yeah. I feel a little, yeah. little tired. Um, so, how much money did you end up saving as a down payment, and what's your, what was your mortgage rate over what number of years, and what's your typical mortgage payment a month? So I, um, I basically, when you're trying to get a loan, uh, generally they only want to loan you twice your income. Mm. So that's only like 80 grand for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's not enough to buy anything. You can't even buy a single bedroom, like one of those, I call them sad condos because it's like mostly (laughs) like divorced people, but yeah. Um, and there's no laundry inside the unit and it's very like, yeah, I I went to see some of those too. It was bad. (laughs) Um, but I... Wait, ask me the question again. <laughs> My brain How much like, did you save as a down payment? Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, like, what do you pay for a mortgage monthly? Okay, so um, I managed to save total. I had forty five grand. Um, in my bank account when I went to sign the um, initial offer. Mm -hmm. So you had to put down, I think it was, I put down like 10 at that time to show that I was serious. And then I had the letter from my um, mortgage company uh, proving that I basically would have the funds. Mm. And so I ended up paying, including closing costs, 40 grand almost exactly Mm. um, and I had <laughs> like a thousand dollars in my checking account and then like three in my savings. And I was like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing like waking up one day and all the zeros are gone on your bank account. All the money's and gone. And you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was, did this to me. <laughs> I know, literally, I was like, what did I do? Why did I do that? I don't understand. Mm. Um, so I got, a, I had to get a special loan because I did buy my condo for $198,000, which mm. is, Obviously more than 80, which is what most people would have loaned me. So I mm. used a, um, a sort of a specialty type loan for people who have low income. Mm. And um, so I got a lot more money than I probably should have, quote unquote, been able to get. 
And that is why I have a 4% um, APR on my 30-year mm. fixed loan. So it can never increase, which is good, but it is a little bit higher than what I could have gotten. So mm. if I had had a higher paying job and would have been able to basically prove that I could pay it back, um, I probably could have gone as low as you know 3.75 or maybe even lower. Yeah. Um, but it just, it was like, I, I need that amount of money. So mm-hmm. then I had to take that kind of loan, which is again, fine because um, I mean, how did they think I got the forty grand in the first place? That wasn't a mis- like, mistake. <laughs> I, I, I saved that. Like, um, right? So, you're clearly responsible. Right. <laughs> but they didn't want to believe it for some reason. I don't know. It's just the numbers, man. <laughs> well, and it, it also affected that I am not a full time employee. So, mm. so um, because of that, that was another factor. So they they really want you to have full time employment when you get a loan. Because again, it seems sketchy that you're part time. Even so though sketchy. you're making forty grand a year, you know, educating you're... America, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the youths, and then my average uh, mortgage payment, like the bare minimum I have to pay, is uh, one thousand uh, seventy five. So mm-hmm. not that much, but I do pay over so that I pay more principal uh, than what is originally included because I think mm. only. $200 of that entire payment goes to my principal payment. Everything else it. is going to my escrow, going to my, um, basically paying them back for giving me the money, the interest. Mm-hmm. Um, so I try to pay back 1500 mm-hmm. every month. That's awesome. Yeah. So tell me about your experience with house hacking because you kind of got into it accidentally. Yes. So for our listeners who aren't familiar with this, ha- house hacking is when you get a place with a mortgage and then you rent out rooms in that place so that so much a certain amount of your mortgage is covered by the other tenants so how did you get into that what's your experience been so far um honestly overall positive experiences because we are sitting here in her condo (laughs) her roommate is here (laughs) we have to say that no we have to say that no just kidding Um, but yeah um so when i was originally looking for condos i really didn't have a specific like you know how many bedrooms do you want type thing i was like just a place where i can live basically and uh, it was really my dad more than encouraged me to go for more bedrooms is better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never really wanted, um, you know, a situation where you only have one bathroom. So that was like the only mm-hmm. thing that really was like, I need to have at least two full bathrooms mm-hmm. if you're going to have at least two rooms, two bedrooms. Um, so when we were looking around, you know, you can find a lot of two bedroom, one and a half bath mm-hmm. and like that. And I was like, mm, honestly, the apartment I rented had a two bedroom, two bath. So that right. was like what I was accustomed to. And so then I actually came to see the place I bought um, multiple times. Mm. I went when they had an open house just to take a look. Um, it was it was an okay shape. It was it would have been move in ready, but mm. it was not updated. It was not very nice, what mm. I would say. Um, and it was a three bedroom, two full bath. And so I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. Great location, third floor. Um, and then I put an offer in on a different place and that offer fell through. And then mm. I put an offer in a different place and that offer fell through. So I went, came back again to see this place, happened to meet the guy who owned the place, mm. talked with him for a while and about the community that it is. I drove around the neighborhood and kind of walked around. I walked down to, um, uh, the lakes that are by here and I mm. kind of just, you know, I was like, all right, I'm digging this area. So, uh, at the time I was still renting with my original roommate and her long-term boyfriend had moved in with us. So it was the three of us living in um, a two bedroom, two bath. And mm. that was all while I was looking. So when I finally made an offer on my actual uh, condo, they were hoping to move with me because mm. they weren't sure they would actually be able to afford something on their own. Mm. So, and at that time, um, you know, they really weren't sure what they were going to do, period. So moving in with me short term was a good setup for them and for me, obviously, because I knew they were going to pay rent. Um, so when I did the renovations on this place, we, um, only had a month left in our lease and I managed to talk them into letting me rent one extra month because Mm -hmm. I was like, there's no way we're going to finish in time. Um, so we finished by the skin of our teeth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were literally putting bathrooms in the day before that we were going to move in here. Oh my God. It was tight. The timing was very, very tight and extremely stressful for me. Um, but we did get them in and then we moved in literally the last day of our <laughs> lease at, at the Berkshires. <laughs> we literally moved in that day. Oh my God. So, I mean, when I say it was to the wire, I mean, we had to hand back the keys and we were still taking stuff out. We were like, go, go, go. Oh my God. Um, so they moved in and it is a three bedroom, um, two bath. And so I rented them two of the bedrooms. 
mm-hmm. because um, they had some of their own stuff too. But the the master bedroom is by far the largest. It takes up most of the square footage of the bedrooms. And then you've got the second bedroom, which is right next to the master, which is a decent size. It's I think it's 12 by 12. Mm-hmm. And then the uh, smaller room, which is uh, right there, is... Uh, I think it's 10 by 11, and that's being generous. I'm pretty sure it's like 10 by 10. But, yeah. Um, and so pretty small space. Um, so they rented both, and I basically let them keep the same amount of money they were paying at the Berkshires here, uh, so they basically wouldn't be in any kind of financial trouble. And I don't regret that at all, because, mm-hmm. again, it's just nice to have some money coming in that's yeah. like... I knew I could afford the place. That was my whole cost benefit analysis of buying was, can you actually afford to live there on your own? And Mm. the answer is yes, obviously I could afford to live there, but I'd be scraping by as opposed to living, I would say pretty comfortably. You know, I'm not concerned about whether I'm going to make my mortgage. You know, I'm, I always have enough money for that. So when they actually did get a place of their own, um, they, couldn't decide exactly when they were going to move out and that went process went on for quite a while there a couple months where they were like not quite sure and Mm. then i found out that my cousin actually Mm -hmm. was thinking about moving out she was 27 at the time and had been living at home and she was obviously very over that and (laughs) she also had a long-term term boyfriend who was living with her at her parents house at the time and she had just finished a trade school and um, he was still in school and they were looking for a place to live and I was like oh my god that'd be so perfect because I know them you know I know that she's got a good job he's got a he had a job too at the time and I knew they were going to be able to afford it and Mm -hmm. that it would be an easy transition so Finally picked a date for my old roommates to move out, and then literally the same day they moved out, my new roommates moved in. I'm noticing a theme. Is this a procrastination trend? What? (laughs) What, Rachel? (laughs) I do feel like the way it's worked out is so good because, like, Mm. even in the first situation, even if they were paying a little less Mm. than what the room was worth, Mm. you had the benefit of knowing them, knowing yes. that you get along with them, knowing what they're like as roommates. Exactly. And knowing that they're good to pay their money. Correct. And then once again, now you're living with somebody who's related to <laughs> yeah. you and her boyfriend who you know very well. Yes. I don't know how well you knew him at the time. Oh, I knew him. I, right. I mean, they had been dating, I think, at least six years by the okay, time they yeah. moved in. So I've known Basically him Basically two family time. members. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that worked out really well. I have to ask, if... Um, your previous roommate and her boyfriend were going to move out and you did not have somebody else you knew who was interested in moving in, would you have made an attempt to rent it out to a different roommate who you didn't know? Absolutely. Okay. I had actually already drafted like a little blurb of what Mm. I was going to say, you know, how I was going to describe. (laughs) Yeah, basically like looking to rent two rooms um, in a three bedroom, two bath, like whatever area of Columbia. And like, this is the price for both rooms. Would prefer if it was just one person or two people together renting both rooms rather than having two completely separate people that I didn't know. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of my goal was to, again, I'm I'm really into throupling, you know? <laughs> so I was like- You're the best third wheel <laughs> I know, I'm I've ever met. <laughs> I roll so hard in the third wheel <laughs> position. So uh, yeah, I was like kind of just hoping another couple would move in and then they just per- happened to perfectly work out. So that was mm. really great for me. It's awesome. Um, and they're still living here and they're going to sign another lease. So, you know, they'll be here for at least another year. And then mm. I told them like, what about like five years? Like, what do we just, like, <laughs> just, just, just enough until here. I pay off my parents, like how much I owe them for my renovations. So. I love it. So, um, do you currently, or did you ever have any other debt aside from your mortgage? No, uh, very, very privileged and thankful that my parents Mm -hmm. paid for my college. Awesome. Um, Yeah, they, they had... I mean, they relatively planned it out. Not that, not like a trust fund planned it out, but they like knew they were going <laughs> to do it. Yeah. Um, and again, I I did get to go to um, the college where my mom works for two years for free because they have a program there that allows you to do that. So they basically awesome. didn't pay anything for the first two years of my college. Like, thank you very much. And then I did one year abroad, which was very expensive, and they were like, please come home. (laughs) And then I did my last year at the uh, University of Maryland. And uh, finished my degree there. (laughs) Hey-o! So, uh, 
So in state still. Yes, too. still in state. Yes. So two years of community college. Yes. Um, using your mom's employment there as a benefit. Mm-hmm. One year abroad and then one year in, in state public school. Very yes. cool. Yeah. I love that. That's very um eclectic. I because that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. Um, so let's talk about furnishing the apartment mm. because I know that you have been very savvy with doing that. Oh my gosh. So how did you keep your furnishing expenses low? Because we know that's another hidden cost of buying your own place. Oh my gosh, that's a huge hidden cost. Yeah, especially even renting. You know, you've got to put some (laughs) furniture in there. I know it too well. (laughs) Right? Um, So again, thankfully for me, my my parents and my extended family all Mm. have very large houses furnished with many, many generations of Mm. furniture because none of us can ever throw anything away. So, um, my- Thank you, hoarders. I know, (laughs) for real, the low-key shout out. Not that Sam's family is hoarders. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, we just didn't throw, like, any type of, anything that's relatively even a little bit sentimental, like, Mm -hmm. just never got rid of it. Or usable. Yes. Uh, If it still functions, it ain't broken, you know? My family is very similar to that. (laughs) So, when I first moved out to the Berkshires, I basically took my what I call my mom's second set of dining furniture, everything that she basically didn't use day to day, but that, that she had kept because it was my not only my grandmother's furniture, it was my great grandmother's furniture. Um, so it was all antique, um, solid wood pieces, which let me tell you were a joy to move. Mm. Um, yeah, and so I and I took my bedroom furniture from my childhood. <laughs> so that was basically everything, and my dad gave me um, the extra quote unquote TV from the basement. Um, so I did not buy a single piece of furniture when what? I moved out to the Berkshires. I'm not kidding. I did not buy literally one item. Not even like a I bought, microwave? <laughs> no, they gave me their extra microwave. My pa- Let me tell you. My <laughs> extra pa- microwave? Yes. They still do, Rachel. Like, they still do. <laughs> I went over there for Thanksgiving, and I was like, all right, we got this, we got this. I was like, oh, let me bring up the extra microwave. I was like, why? Why do you have two microwaves? You guys don't even cook. <laughs> but yeah, so I that microwave right there, that's my parents' microwave. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, oh, JK, my mom bought me that toaster. There you go. That's Aww, something new that came to Berkshires. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, and I'd, so when we moved from the Berkshires originally, we just brought all of our stuff mm. from the Berkshires to here. And it filled the space reasonably well. It didn't really fit great because it is gigantic, fully wood, antique furniture. And so it was yep. massive. Um, but we just didn't have any choice. Like even the, the couches Rachel and I are sitting on right now are <laughs> my parents' extra couches, quote unquote, um, that are from 19, <laughs> 1995, baby. Um, oh my God. <laughs> girl, if I took off these, I love their plaid just to like, let me give you a little mental picture here. They're green plaid with mm. red, yellow, and navy blue. <laughs> Merry Christmas, us. Yes. So they have couch covers. That's, again, something I bought for myself. Whoa. Big splurge there, yeah. Sam. No, but I actually like debated for like a long time. I was like, should I get couch covers? Like, should I do it? Because mm. it's like, you know, am I going to keep these couches forever? Probably not. But I, am I going to keep them until they fall apart? Yes. <laughs> I love so. that. And this kind of leads to another question that I have, and that is, what did your parents teach you about money? Because every time we've talked about it, it seems like they have instilled some really, really good money values in you, from, at least in my opinion, right. as somebody who grew up with, like, not financially <laughs> savvy parents. Yeah. So what what kind of lessons have you garnered from growing up in your family? So definitely, um, I think my parents, my mom, my dad have different views on money, um, and very typical white family we did not talk mm-hmm. about finances and like when i did have questions my dad was like why do you want to know <laughs> like why white family tm <laughs> white. <laughs> we are white af <laughs> so um basically i've always been a saver i mean you can really you could you could interview my mom about this she will mm-hmm. verify i've just don't like spending money natural to you i just mm-hmm. like I'm like a little dragon. I want to hoard all my coins and sit on top of them. Like, mm-hmm. I don't even need to do anything with them. I just <laughs> want them. And um, my brother is the complete opposite. So it's so interesting that we had the same, you know, childhood, mm-hmm. basically same parents, same I- ideas and values about money put on us. But he's totally different. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, he just got a brand new car. He gets a new car, like, every couple of years. Because, I have anxiety right now. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what he likes. So, like, he wants to have a brand new car. He wants to have, you know, nice electronic things and, like, things that are very expensive, which is fine. Like, I think that's totally a lifestyle choice that you can choose. That's not me, though. Like, I Mm -hmm. would rather... I had my last cell phone, I think I had for over five years, and my parents finally were like, get rid of it. 
It has mm. a crack on the screen. It's not very fast. Like, you know, stuff that doesn't bother me. But they were like, you, you need to have some nice things. Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> it looks like we have to deprive you. Yeah, literally. <laughs> like, like. So um, my dad is definitely a natural saver. And um, my mom, I wouldn't say she's a spender necessarily, but she doesn't think too, too hard when it comes to spending money. Mm-hmm. If she wants something, she's going to buy it. But they're both in very f- secure financial positions. Right. They're both higher earners. Exactly, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, um, they grew up both pretty poor. So, I mean, yeah. not like you know, not dying poor, but they grew up without a lot of money and, you know, Mm -hmm. their big outing as a restaurant would be to go to McDonald's. Or, you know, there was this place called Peter Pan that was like sort of like a McDonald's-y type thing, but Mm. you go through a little line and then you sit down. So it's like a little bit different, (laughs) my parents would say. I've never actually been there, just heard a lot about it. Where are they from? They are both from Columbia. Oh. If you can believe that, yeah. And Peter Pan just doesn't exist anymore? It does not. It went out of business. Oh, wow. Yeah. So my dad is from (laughs) Mount Hebron area. My mom's from Wild Lake. Wow. So my mom went to Wild Lake High School. Oh my gosh. Yes. We moved a lot because my dad at the time um, was, he was working his normal full-time job, but then he also had his own business on the side as sort of like a house building with a couple of his brother-in-laws. Mm, so, so did he grow that business correct. while he was doing his full-time job yes. and then made it his full-time job? No, he actually ended up staying at his normal full-time job oh. the whole time. So yeah, he's a hard, like, I mean, uh, that's a Just hard a worker. Course. Yeah. yeah. He can't chill too much like that's not really like his thing he'll go home and he'll be like my mom and i used to joke about this all the time we had just normal drywalls inside the house in one of our our houses and he was like you know what wayne's coating i want to put some wayne's coating up and we were like but why (laughs) because we just lived in construction constant construction Mm. but those little upgrades you know that don't take him hardly any money just the products basically and he seems to enjoy it too yes i would argue (laughs) um and so that increases the value of the house and so he did a lot of that kind of stuff when we were growing up in between big moves he would do Mm. small things like that and eventually as he got older he they scaled back just doing um like kitchen renovations they did some porches and like stuff like that um when they didn't want to build whole homes anymore and at a certain point it becomes non-cost effective because the housing market was getting huge this is Mm. all before the bubble burst so Mm. this is all pre-2008 we bought um the house that i lived most of my life in well a good chunk of it uh in 1999 so it was finished being built i said we bought it but we built it so they bought Mm -hmm. the lot then they built on it and we stayed there for a good decade and that Mm -hmm. was probably the longest i've ever stayed at any one location and when they sold that i mean it had increased in value that was some crazy figure i can't remember they bought it for i think like closer to like the low end of the hundreds Mm -hmm. and they sold it for a crazy amount of money wow Yeah, it was, I mean, a great investment on his part. And he got into it at a point when it was really popping. Like, you could really buy land out in what seemed like almost the middle of nowhere, but build these custom mansions Mm -hmm. and sell them for a crazy price. So that was, like, a huge thing for him. And that made him secure, basically, um, where he can do, you know, he wanted a new truck, he can get a new truck. You know, he Mm -hmm. wants to go buy a brand new whatever, he can do that, you know. So what renovations have you done with your condo? Mm -hmm. And how much of these cost? So much. (laughs) And how much do you estimate they've increased the value? Okay. Um, So when I bought the place, like I said, it was okay. I could have moved into it. Um, But uh, obviously I let my dad talk me into a lot of renovations. (laughs) Because originally I was like, you know what, let's just buy it. Done. Don't do anything to it. And my dad was like, "Mm, you know, when you move in, there's no better time to do it because you're not living there yet. You know, all this other stuff. So he basically convinced me um, to knock down a wall. So Mm -hmm. in my kitchen, it was walled off and then a separate dining room. Mm -hmm. I knocked the wall that was conjoining those down. And then there was another wall separating the kitchen and the dining room from the living room. And I partially knocked that one down. Mm -hmm. I left some of it because the water line for the fridge is in that area. And I Mm -hmm. just, the cost of moving that was just not worth it. Yeah. Plus I... I cook a lot and I love to have countertop space. Mm-hmm. So I decided to make it a fully combined kitchen dining room. So there's no dining room anymore. It's basically just all kitchen. Mm-hmm. And so I've got 18 feet of countertop on one wall. Then I've got about four on another wall. And then I've got four on this other wall. Mm. So I have got an insanely huge kitchen for a 1300 square foot apartment mm. and knocking down the walls. And um, I also gutted the bathroom. So both mm. bathrooms they had linoleum in them they were bad Mm -hmm. um you know just really old toilets old vanities just really old stuff and then we ripped those out and unfortunately 
as always, there are always unexpected costs with renovations. Mm -hmm. The person who had owned before us, or possibly even the person before them, had incorrectly installed the pipes for the tub areas. So what they had done, probably to save money, was install sink piping, Mm -hmm. which is not fit to handle that type of water pressure, underneath the... um, tubs and Mm. what had happened is actually a small leak had actually already occurred Mm. so they no one knew at the time but we could actually see it from above that the person below me their bathroom was getting a slow drip onto their the ceiling of their bathroom and now unfortunately or fortunately this is a concrete slab um apartment building so it's very very sturdy it's long lasting but you can only replace the pipes from below. Mm. So uh, a lot of the stuff is underneath the slab as opposed to on top of, because it would lower the ceilings. Mm. So <laughs> we had to ask the people below us, oh. would it be okay if I destroy the ceiling of your bathrooms? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yes. And they were very cool about it. Um, I really, That's awesome. Yeah. Oh my God. I could have been really bad because I was like, what's happening basically is I have a very, very small leak Mm -hmm. from improperly sold pipes, which I basically have to fix now that I know it's there. Right. um, Ethically, but also just building code wise. Right. Um, And it's not a huge deal now. I was like, but if we keep those pipes there, Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have leaks and maybe a massive one. And I was like, and it's your place, you know, so like their stuff is going to be ruined. So he understood that and he was like, yeah, that's fine. And um, so he did actually let me go into both bathrooms, rip out their ceilings. (laughs) Uh, which I replaced, I paid for, and uh, I repaint. Uh, I personally didn't replace them, but I paid for them to be replaced and repainted. Kind of did him a favor. Yeah, I like to think so. <laughs> Just interrupted their lives yeah, a bit. <laughs> Loki, yeah, he was like, uh, the best part was he was like actually about to get in the shower, and I was like, no, but like right now. About to get in the shower. <laughs> he was like, oh, have I'm... I got news for you? <laughs> I was wow. like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Because of that is, he was like, "Oh no, it's fine. I'll just, I'll, I'll it's fine. I'll just do it later." Okay. Great. <laughs> so um, we did that, and that was a big hidden cost because it also pushed my schedule back. Mm. So when you are doing a renovation, you you need to think about the basically the order of operations. You know, as, as our math people would like to say, and <laughs> you can't put in the floor before the toilet. You, can, you know, mm-hmm. there's just like there's just certain things that have to go in a certain order. So we were able to get a lot of stuff done that. You know, in the kitchen, for example, we focused on the kitchen for a solid, like, two weeks. Got that almost completely done, except there was no water because the plumbing Mm. had to be shut off because there was no bathrooms. You can't Um, enjoy your nice kitchen. Yeah, I was like, oh, God. But, uh, let's see, total cost of renovation was about, I was trying to keep it at 20 more like 30 it was like mm-hmm. 28 and change okay um so 28 grand was a lot more than i had intended on spending but i mean honestly i love everything in here i picked everything mm-hmm. out you know myself and every ca- cabinet you see in the kitchen mm-hmm. i carried up the stairs <laughs> myself <laughs> Like, every piece of hardwood floor that's in here, mm. my parents and Paulina, shout out Paulina. Oh, shout out Paulina. She was <laughs> hungover AF. <laughs> she came over here, and we carried 50-pound boxes up for probably a, a good hour and a half, just oh trying God. to get all the flooring up here. Mm. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I could do, I did. We call mm. that sweat equity. Yes. So it's the amount of work that you're willing to put in. So anything I could do, like, I helped grout my own bathrooms, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, like... Anything you can do to hurry the process along and get it going, you try to do. And, and also, it does save money. Yeah. But renovations, I will say, are incredibly expensive. And that's mm-hmm. why a lot of people, I would say these days, are looking for move-in ready yeah. places. I, almost nobody wants to do demolitions and do renovations because there are always unexpected costs. Well, it's all that cost, but it's also all the time, time. and inconvenience oh, that yeah. it's going to cost you. And we know time is money. So I have to like... schedule everything. You got to, you yeah. know, you got to call everybody. I, we had a huge Excel sheet, just mm-hmm. like, you know, who's going to be there at what, what time, what products they need. Because if you tell them to buy the product, of course, there's going to be an upcharge because they have to go get it and then they're going to pay for that time. So then if you're willing to go say, okay, what do you need? I'm going to go buy it for you and bring it back mm-hmm. here at this scheduled time or whatever. So I probably went out to, um, you know, Home Depot and um, uh, Wood Floor Plus mm. and all those type of places, I would say a good hundred times mm. in, in one month period. This video is not sponsored by Home Depot. Uh, low key, it's not. So but how much did this, did all of these renovations increase the value of your condo? Do so you I bought it for one ninety eight. It was listed at two fifteen at the time, which um, I knew I wasn't going to pay two fifteen for it because the guy, because I had actually met him, I had a chance to talk to him and I knew he was trying to sell because they had already bought another house. So mm. for me, the timing just worked 
perfectly. Good. And um, he actually decided, or no, he had a, a, an offer, all cash for the full two fifteen from a woman who was going to buy it. And then she rescinded her offer when she realized it's a third floor walk up with no possibility of getting an elevator. Like oh, there's gosh, just yeah. no possibility. And mm-hmm. she was an older lady. And so yeah. um, he had had two offers rescinded before I made my offer. And mm. he was kind of like over it at that time. Seriously, especially so, if you're paying two mortgages. Exactly. Goodbye. And so, yeah, he was like, literally like, let's just do this thing. Um, so not only did I only pay 198, I also got cash to close help. So mm-hmm. sometimes when you're buying, you can offer or you can ask the seller to uh, cover some of the closing costs for you because mm-hmm. the closing costs can be upwards of 10 grand. Mm-hmm. And um, generally it's the buyer's responsibility. Mm-hmm. Not always, kind of depends state to state. Um, but we had put that in the offer that I was not gonna pay the closing cost by myself basically. Mm-hmm. And so that really helped me out as well. Um, so when I look, I every now and then I think you like to go a little shopping on Zillow. You look around. Oh, I do it all the time. Who doesn't? It's like a I escapism. love to look at super expensive oh, apartments yeah. and also super cheap ones. I'd be like, yeah. could I do could it? I, could I live there? <laughs> no, you can't. Trust me. <laughs> um, so <Watch> there's me. <laughs> in, <laughs> in this neighborhood, uh, there was recently a two bedroom. Two bath uh, sold for two thirty five, mm. so that's a pretty decent um, increase. And I also did just get my my property taxes went up because I got a new uh, what's it called when they come and look at your a new Inspection? audit, yeah, yeah, audit? Mm-hmm. and they um, increased the value of my property, and I was like. Mm. It's a double-edged sword. You're happy because mm-hmm. they increase the value of your property, but then you're sad because you have to pay the property <laughs> taxes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which the property taxes in Howard County are unreal. <laughs> I mean, I like, believe it. I pay so much in taxes, and I don't have any land, zero percent mm. land. I'm like, but it's should, we're stacked though. Like, should that <laughs> affect? Okay, fine. <laughs> um, but uh, so if I put, we'll think I put about twenty eight in here. I bought it for one ninety eight. So at this point, what? five grand total Mm. increase but um, I'm not going to sell right away so the thing about investing is holding it until it becomes more valuable because literally Columbia is blowing up like so many places are just incredibly expensive and this area too I feel like in particular being so close to the mall yeah being close to the mall you're you're just Mm -hmm. just close enough to everything Mm -hmm. Um, and then you still have greenery in the back like the the patch behind me that's like um Thanks, Columbia Association. Uh, <laughs> protected land because it basically can't be built on because it's all swampy, sort of like creeks. Mm. Um, they uh, are never going to be able to get rid of that. So you're always going to have greenery behind you, which I think is a huge draw for people who are looking to live in the city but not feel like they're living in the city. Yeah. So yeah. location, location, location. You know, mm-hmm. I call this place the treehouse because of that. Because I've And I've also never lived anything lower than the third floor. <laughs> and it's always been a walk up. So it's just something you get used to. But... Um, I wouldn't say it's increased enough. Although Matt jokingly said one of my roommates said that he would um he would be interested like in buying the place, and I was like, oh really? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're joking, but, but we'll like, hold you to it. Yeah, I was like, mm. <laughs> but I could sell it now and still come out in the positive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that would be necessarily the smartest thing to do unless yeah. someone was really willing to pay like top market price, which I don't think is very realistic, but. If I could get two forty five out of this place, I would definitely make a profit. Mm-hmm. So great. Yeah. So, what advice would you give to first time home buyers? <sighs> Take your time. Honestly, I think mm. there's a once you decide to do it, there's like this this feeling like, oh, we have to do this. We have to do this right now. It can take two years to find the correct place. And also, like I said, I got rejected two offers um, that I put in before the place I actually bought. Mm. So you know, you, you wouldn't you won't expect that as well. And the other huge thing is buy less than what you think you can afford. Because I bought at the very top of my budget. My absolute top price was 210 mm. and I bought at 198 mm. And because of that, like, I skipped down on some of the nicer things that I could have. And in real, like, I'm looking back at it, I know I should have done it. So just as, for example, I have laminate uh, countertops. And they are already starting to show wear after it's only been, this is the end of the second year. So that's not great, you yeah. know, considering they already caught basically five grand. It was like $4,980 something dollars. Mm. So for a five grand countertop to only last, let's be real, five years, mm-hmm. that's not cost effective. No. And my dad actually told me, 
props to him. He was like, <laughs> get the quartz. You just get the cheap quartz, even if it's not what you like. And I was mm-hmm. like, I don't want that. I want this specific. I had this vision, you know, mm-hmm. and I wanted it to look the way I wanted it to look. And I had had laminate countertops at the Berkshires, which were perfectly fine. Right. And they weren't new and they were fine. So they were like mm-hmm. probably five years old when we got to them and they, they looked decent. They held up mm-hmm. decently. Um, but I don't know what is with these countertops, but I've already got several nicks in them and like little scratches mm-hmm. and I've got a piece that's coming off and so um, that is one thing I would have done differently is is again thinking about the long term cost versus yeah. the upfront cost mm-hmm. so because I spent that five grand on getting the countertops that I wanted at that time I will not be able to keep them for very long I and then realize you know we talked about this before but when it's not broken you're not going to fix it so right. I will keep them until I'm ready to sell mm-hmm. when I do finally sell I will probably upgrade them before I sell mm-hmm. because they're going to be an eyesore at that point you know what I mean yeah. something so small that doesn't have a huge cost can literally detract people from buying so what I would say is be careful with <laughs> wanting to get it done cheaply and now versus what is actually going to be effective in the resale because yeah. if i can keep these floors until i resell and not change them that's a huge cost in my favor like if i had done exactly what i wanted and put in an even more expensive flooring maybe they would last even better but if mm-hmm. these make it then it was worth it right and these right. are also the floors i wanted so it's like again yeah. that balance between okay i want this done now i want this just because it's cheap and i can do it and i know mm-hmm. i can afford it but then you also want to look at you are going to probably sell at some point. And, you know, if that's more than 10 years away, maybe you don't need to think about it too, too much. But I realize now there are some things I probably should have spent a little bit more upfront cash and then I wouldn't have to have so much maintenance cash. Yeah. So. Yeah. That is, it's such an awesome and interesting investment. But like it listening is. to you talking about it and giving the numbers, I'm like... Woo! Stressed. Yeah. I will be renting for, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, okay, so my loan originally was for 158000 plus, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit more. Um, and I'm now down, I just got down below one forty four. Mm-hmm. So I am paying it down quite quickly, but it is a huge cost. Yeah. I mean, and I still owe my parents from the renovations uh, because, again, my very privileged, very lucky that my parents were willing to put the cash up front for the renovations. Because mm. if they hadn't been oh, willing to put thing. that mm-hmm. cash up front, I just genuinely, I, told you, I had less than five grand in my mm. in my account. So there's no way I could have afforded to do the renovations. But again, I let my dad talk me into it and he was putting the money up at front. So I was like, all right. I will take it, Dad. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. So I have a question about... Um, so you come from a family where your parents are both high earners and you have a, and they're dual income yes. earners as well. Um, do you ever feel limited by your lower income working as an adjunct faculty at the college? I think it's a lifestyle choice for me. Yeah. Like, I just, even though I, I did talk about I like money, like to have it. Um, me but too. I don't, I, I have a real strong <laughs> like passion about... Like to make about, it, like to keep it. <laughs> um, not dying. Uh, yeah. So... I definitely am poor. Like, they think I'm poor. I am poor. It's fine. But, like, I don't need a lot of things. Like, Mm -hmm. a lot of things that they're like, well, if you had a full-time job, you could have this, or you could do this, or you Mm could do this. It's like, that's cool, but I don't need to do that. And that's not Mm -hmm. necessarily what fulfills me. Like, I actually really like my job. Yeah. And it's so rare. I talk to, like, all my friends, and almost no one likes their job anymore. Like, they just feel like they're slave labor, wage labor, you know, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Like... They're doing something that makes no difference that anybody else could do. There's nothing special about it. You know, they don't feel fulfilled. And that's terrifying to me to spend that much time not doing something that I'm even remotely passionate about or that doesn't fulfill me because I have a great time at my job. Like, yeah, I love to talk, obviously. And I love to hear myself talk. (laughs) And we love hearing you talk. Hey, (laughs) thanks. Come to my classes. Um, But yeah, and I get great feedback from my students. Like my students, Mm -hmm. they love to tell me that they loved having me. And I'm Mm. like, oh, I loved having you too. That's amazing. Like we had such a great time together. I'm so glad we're both here. And that's so much more important to me than any dollar figure. Yeah. I do understand that because I don't have health insurance and a retirement, you know, from my job, that that is, that is a downside. That's obviously a downside. Huge downside, yeah. Um, and if I was to get seriously injured, you know, I have like a seven grand deductible. 
Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, I have over seven grand in my bank account, so I could. So cover you've that. saved for that emergency. I know. Mm-hmm. I'm aware of that, and I've mm-hmm. also been in a very serious car accident, so I know what would happen if I didn't have a car anymore. Mm. And you know, I probably could get a loan, but I wouldn't want that. You know what I mean? So yeah. I just I have a a pretty significant savings bundle because I'm aware that I don't have health insurance through, you know, a mm-hmm. reputable, reliable source. <laughs> Although I would say I, I pay almost nothing for my health care, so shout out um, the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Ob- thank you, Obama. Thank you, Obama. You've covered me as well no, in the past. <laughs> dental insurance, I pay so little because I'm in Howard County, mm-hmm. and the median income is so high, and yeah. my income is, in comparison, so low. <laughs> which Thanks, Howard think, County. 40,000 grand not, is, in most of the country, not that low. Yeah. But in here, like, I think I'm very close to the poverty line. Oh, like, yeah. very. And so, um, and to be fair, it is very expensive here. Right. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't care about making any more money than I'm making, I as think, long as I'm happy. I think that's such a teacher thing. Yeah, like, it's true. Very true. I'm not here for the money. Yes. Um, I'm aware. I'm it's here not because I'm passionate. <laughs> right, right. I know what I got into. Yes. I know this profession Correct. isn't going to make me a billionaire. No. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> but I do also wonder at the same time if your comfort level with being poor, as you say, is in fact like a result of your privilege. Because I know for true. me, I could not work for the amount you work. And with knowing that I wouldn't also have the health insurance right. and the benefits of being a full-time employee. Yeah. Because I am so averse to um, risk. And I also have been uninsured. Right. And I have, you know, had parents who are self-employed who don't get any kind of, like, employee benefits Oof, for them. Yeah. And so I've, like, seen the negative effects of that. Obviously, you are much more <laughs> financially savvy than my parents. And you, you are doing very well. But I do wonder, like, like I don't think I would have been able to make the decision that you made yeah. because of my background. So I wonder if there's even an aspect of privilege in your choice to be a part-time Correct. educator. And do I that mean, too. when you think about the fact that I've literally never had a full-time job. Ever. And the That's amount crazy. Of, well, and the yeah. amount of time I have off is unreal. So right now, I'm on break. I've been on break since like the 5th of December. So I have (laughs) all of December off and I have all of January off. Mm -hmm. And then um, I have, if I wanted, the summer's off too. Mm -hmm. So I could afford to not teach in the summer. So that's what, five months off basically? Mm -hmm. Because I'm done. Because I teach lab, we finish early. So I'm done basically like usually by the earlier than the 10th of May. So I'm going to count all of May, all of June, Mm -hmm. all of July. All of August. So your per month income is actually pretty sweet. Yes. <laughs> if you like, looked at it like if, if you if I if I if you only look at the months I'm working, I make a great amount of money. But mm-hmm. if you look at the whole year altogether, it's a lot less impressive. Um, <laughs> but and there is like very sporadic income. So like I know that I will not make any well, so mm. the way the payments are delayed, you've got I just got my last payment. So I get paid bi monthly. And um, they they push it back like one session. So like mm-hmm. you miss. So when you first start working, you're not getting paid, which is very difficult at the very beginning. Oh yeah, to, that's like, everywhere. Work with much. not getting paid. Yeah. Um, but then when you stop, you're still getting paid. Mm-hmm. So I just got my last payments. I will not get paid anymore in December or January or f- possibly February, depending on how that break how the 15 because I get paid on the 15th and I get paid mm. on the last day of the month so depending on how that works out um I potentially will not get paid or will get paid on the very last day of February wow so I know that yeah and I plan accordingly let's talk about that how do you budget for a sporadic income uh yes yeah. so I keep um <laughs> way more in my checking account than I really need to because I often pay my mortgage in advance Mm-hmm. So, for example, over the summer, uh, I knew it wasn't going to be working. So, in May, I paid my mortgage for three months in advance so mm-hmm. that I just wouldn't even have to worry about it. I also don't count the money that I know that I'm going to be spending as my money. I mm-hmm. just I don't even, like, even though the numbers are there, right, you just don't even see it because yep. that's not true. You don't have that money. That mm-hmm. money is already spent on your mortgage. Preach. So, <laughs> girl, I'm going to tell you that money is spent. Um, <laughs> So a lot of times, like, the number in my bank account is way higher than what I would tell people that I have. Not because I'm afraid of saying how much money I have, but because that money is spent. It's already gone. It's like, not available. It's too. not available. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's, it is spoken for. Um, it, it, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Don't ask about it because it ain't happening. Um, and so I just plan that out. Basically, 
actually am very fucking old school. And we talked about how we're both mm. not really that great with technology. So I have a, <laughs> I have a notebook that has a tally mm. of what I've spent every month, basically, like the a- so that I can see the Whoa. average. Yeah, and of course I should put that on an Excel sheet, obviously, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> like, Whatever works for you, myself, works yeah. for you. And so I'll do all these when I get. A little bit stressed. So, you know, Mm -hmm. you talked about that anxiety, that stress from not having income come in regularly. Yeah. I get that too. But it's a little bit not, because I've done it for so long now, (laughs) I don't really feel it as strong. (laughs) I'm like, nah, nah, it's fine. (laughs) And I also have to say, like, because I never get sick. I mean, Mm -hmm. I got sick the end of the semester, but that's a rare. Yeah. I mean, when was the last time I had to go, had to go to the doctor? Now I still get my checkup just to make sure everything's fine. But, Mm -hmm. and I go to the dentist twice a year. Like I do the maintenance stuff because health can be extremely expensive, but I'm, I have no allergies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have no healthcare related expenses. And that is, if I didn't have that, I couldn't live my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So it's not like my lifestyle is going to be appropriate or even doable for most people. Because if you even had asthma, if you had even just really bad allergies. Or talking about all the people that are your age that already have children. Right. Oh, fuck. Oh, God. <laughs> right. So there's like a, a lot of play right. here. Like, and, and I also don't ever plan to have children. So right. the, and my lifestyle would be so totally different mm-hmm. if I thought that. Right. So I mean, that's a really good point because mm-hmm. people with children, I mean, you have to plan that stuff out because mm-hmm. they are so expensive. But I just, um, you know, I just look at my budget and then I just spend accordingly. I really yeah. am. Like I said, I don't need things. I, the last time I went shopping, I didn't even go shopping for myself. I went for Christmas presents because yeah. it is the season. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I spent like 100 bucks and I was like, ugh. You know, like yeah. spending that amount of money on any material item to me is like kind of crazy. Yeah. Like I'll buy flights. You know, I've been outside mm-hmm. the country a bunch of times and I, I like experiences. I like yeah. concerts. We go camping. Um, and those are my vacations. Like, I like camping. People are like, oh, you're just doing that because it's a cheap vacation. I'm like, no, I, I actually genuinely enjoy it. Let me tell you, me discovering that I liked camping uh-huh. was probably the best thing for my right? travel budget in the world. It just, it's crazy how little money It spend. is crazy cheap. The last time that we went camping yeah. together, Sam, I think we all paid like... Less than $100. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. And including it, food. Exactly. For like multiple days. Yeah. That and was a great split. thing that we did, though. I like, know. Or... Bring her awesome. <laughs> it, girl. High five. Literally. But yeah, I mean, we were very smart about it. And yeah. like, because we all had the, and we all have tents now. So like, I get that there yeah. is some upfront cost with camping, but yeah. um, I mean, honestly, I got my, t- my tent on sale for like 40 bucks. Yeah. And it's a great tent. I I love it. So, you know. I know. I got the same one that you and have. so did Monica. I asked my parents <laughs> for it for Christmas and I got the same one. But like. And yeah, now we have matching tents. And we literally <laughs> so- did. We had them all set up one, two, three on the campsite. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's just like, I don't like, I don't wear jewelry, you know, right. I, that's, and that's not because I don't, I mean, I just don't really like jewelry. You're such an accidental minimalist. I, literally. It's I love completely it. accidental. I literally had to like purge things from my yeah. life and like totally accept this like intentional style of living. Yeah. You're just doing it. You're like, just, like minimalism like who? I don't even know her. <laughs> this is just me, yeah. Samantha. Yeah. L- literally. Um, and like I was telling you, I cut my own hair the other day and yep. someone was like, oh, I love your hair. And I was like, thanks. I cut it myself. And they were like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I grew it and cut it. I, literally, it's all me. <laughs> so, and I don't wear makeup. And again, that's not yeah. because whatever. I just don't like it. I, yeah. It's just not a thing that I like. You know? Well, we have to acknowledge some privilege in that too, though, because we know that women in the workplace, in not the education field, no. of course, because we're just flooded with women, but in other workplaces, have to wear makeup literally to get hired, right? To be taken you look seriously, kind to be of dead without it, right? To to be seen as um, clean and responsible right. and not lazy and womanly too. That's oh, the other yeah. thing. It's like, and then with the hair thing, yeah, like we as white women with like pretty quote unquote standard hair right, right? not really standard just yeah. but you know society thinks of us as standard we don't have to do anything to it Correct. but for women I of color nothing. or just even women with like totally different hair textures they actually the have to yeah. invest in those products as an investment for their careers right, right? so if That's not really even true. just for wanting to feel comfortable in a That's situation, absolutely. which is also valid. So yeah. I totally agree with you because I also don't spend money on haircuts or my nails yeah. or anything like that. But I also, and I don't really wear makeup except my eyebrows. I do them <laughs> <Hey> every day. <laughs> they look nice though, but they do look nice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. They have to. <laughs> Otherwise my ego will die. <laughs> They're really all I have going for me. 
No, but um, but I I also work in a female dominated field where we're not expected to wear makeup Absolutely every single true. day. Maybe yeah. at some schools you are, but I don't think not it's in my a, school. an expectation more of like. Mm-hmm. I, I do think people respond better to you when you're good looking. So if this is you true, know, that is a big privilege as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. if you know, like you have whatever going on, you need to fix. Cool. I hate that though, but yeah, that you need to change or look better somehow. Then it is a thing. Like people do treat you different based on how you look. But like, <laughs> and again, if you look in my shower right now, you'll see a uh, random stuff because I like Caitlyn didn't like some shampoo she bought, so she was like, mm-hmm. "Do you want the shampoo for free?" I'm like. Perfect. Done. Don't even need to look at it. Don't care. <laughs> you know, I have no brand loyalty at all. It's so <laughs> crazy because I feel like we were raised in households of totally different socioeconomic status, and yet we have very similar. <laughs> I like our parents had very similar ideas about like frugality right. and stuff. Yes, and so definitely. this is really fun. I am like, oh yeah, me too, but like, because I'm poor. <laughs> 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 you were just raised right because they could. <laughs> yeah, because they were like, this is how we do it. I don't know. <laughs> But I love that. I just, and I, and again, maybe it does come from like a little bit of a hoarder place, but mm. why would I get rid of something that is like still functioning? And I just this doesn't is how even you're not a minimalist. So. <laughs> no, it's true though. You were like, oh, minimalist. I'm like, look at this. This is how the roads die. <laughs> they do. From you and And that's where I, I consider myself more of an anti consumptionist from yes, that perspective. Yes. Because I definitely like, girl, go look at my room. Mm-hmm. It is a, first of all, <laughs> it is a mess in there because I'm in a transitory period of getting organized. And I'm I, between organization systems. Styles. Yeah, <laughs> literally. But like everything is everywhere right now. Um, so definitely not a minimalist in that sense. And I also have like this weird attachment to some material things mm-hmm. that I've had since childhood. Like oh, my mom finally made me throw away a pair of, I call them lounge pants. Whenever I retire <laughs> something that's like, it's not good enough to wear outside anymore. Mm-hmm. It now becomes lounge clothes. So like <laughs> I still had the very first pair of yoga pants that I had ever gotten mm. and they just had huge holes in them and I just wore them around the house and since they're yoga pants we know that you got them in like 2008 oh yeah, when it, that trend right, was it thing. started yeah <laughs> definitely literally um so yeah I probably had them for a long time at that point and mom was like please just get rid of them so she bought mm-hmm. me these ones instead <laughs> oh no these are very yeah, nice thanks they're only like knits for yeah. those of you listening yeah <laughs> So um, I do need to get rid of, like, I do need to declutter and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But I I just don't want to buy things. I don't see the point in it if yeah. I already have something that's reasonably good. And, like, I have a whole bag full of clothes that are, they're for work, but they have a small hole in it. Like, I tend to rip the armpits of stuff. Yeah. I was going to say, I probably have one there. Um, <laughs> And um, just like, uh, you know, the chub rub. You get those oh, little yeah. holes in between your thighs because your fat thighs rub it together all the time. You, no, because you're beautiful. <laughs> yes. Voluptuous. Voluptuous. I like that. That's cool. <laughs> um, but all that would it takes is a sewing needle and a piece of thread. And yeah. you can just put those holes back together and then you can wear them for probably another year, realistically. Yeah. And there's also the whole sustainability aspect of that. And I Correct. know you are super eco-friendly and sustainable. Yes. But we should probably Try save that be. for another Try podcast. <laughs> Are we getting off topic? What? Us? Is there a topic? <laughs> but I love it. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me today, yeah, Sam. Of course, Rachel. Love it. This is what our conversations are normally like. <laughs> yeah, but like... Which might be boring to most people, but to us it's pretty fun. Yes. 